That's okay. I actually, well, I actually wanted to apologize to everybody because one of the things that I noticed in looking at the um, title of my talk today was uh, that it included the topic of abortion, um, which could be a day-long conversation in and of itself. And I, so my slides don't actually address that. I'm happy to um, take questions on it or discuss it in the discussion point, but hopefully you'll find that I do talk about enough uh, stimulating topics. Um, so I was going to keep it a little bit case-based. I've got some cases for you. I am going to speak towards uh, female genital cutting and mutilation, and we'll talk about women's health care issues in a refugee population, including contraception, pregnancy, cervical cancer screening, and infertility. My comments are based, uh, for the most part, on the evidence-based guidelines for immig immigrants and refugees from this, uh, 2011, uh, which was published in the CMAJ, uh, as well as some additional evidence and personal experience, although those guidelines are very, very limited in terms of their recommendations on reproductive health. Um, we did actually, myself and some colleagues, publish some pearls of reproductive health care in this population in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Canada last year, and we're actually going to be working on a guideline in this area as well for the SOGC. So case one is Sarah. She's 50 years old for obstetrical lingo for you. Uh, she's had two pregnancies and one child in the past. She's perimenopausal. She came to Canada from South Sudan seeking asylum a couple of years ago, and she's been living with type 3 FGM since it was performed when she was 11 years old. This is noted on examination and discussed, and she complains of pain with intercourse, dribbling with urination, and general discomfort and irritation, and a referral for a defibrillation procedure is offered. Um, so female genital mutilation or cutting is described as all procedures involving partial or total removal of the female external genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. Um, again, we could go on at great length about what do we call the practice. I'll suffice it to say that there's no consensus in the literature. Um, it's very hard, for example, when you're sitting in front of a patient who is actually um, feels that this was beneficial to her and doesn't have a problem with it, for you to sit there and tell them that their body is mutilated and to call it a mutilation. Um, it's also hard to, you know, accept just calling it cutting to those of us who feel that it's so much more. Um, I personally don't usually call it female circumcision. I don't believe that it's analogous to the male procedure, um, but again, that's that term is used in the literature in places. So I'll alternate in my terminology because I just don't really know what else to do and the literature has the same equipoise. Um, so the World Health Organization uh, estimates that this practice affects over 200 million women and girls around the world. It takes place in more than 30 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, it, regions of West, East, and Northeast Africa in particular, some Middle Eastern and Asian countries, um, and due to migration, well, I mean, it's a, it's a worldwide issue, and in particular, due to migration, we see it everywhere in the world. Um, these are the areas in which it's particularly prevalent, the uh, red areas in particular, uh, where over 80% of women have been cut. World Health Organization classifies four different types. Um, the pictures here, I know they're hard to see, but just uh, the upper left of your screen is a normal external female genitalia. Type one on the upper right is where the clitoris has been removed. Type two on the lower left, uh, where the clitoris and labia minora have been removed, and type 3, which is also called infibulation on the lower right, where the clitoris, uh, labia minora have been removed, and then they've been sewn, the raw areas have been sewn together to leave only a very small opening for urination, menstruation, and uh, very painful sexual intercourse. Uh, there is a type 4 as well, which is all other forms of um, sort of intentional injury to the female genitalia that don't fall into these categories. Uh, and I have certainly seen many cultural practices that I had never heard of described before they presented in my office. Um, why do we do that? Why does anybody do this? Um, in the locations in which it happens, it seems to conform to social norms um, and local beliefs about acceptable, acceptable sexual behavior, marriageability, fidelity, infidelity, cleanliness. Uh, in my opinion, they all relate down to power and control of women's bodies. Um, there are many, many repercussions of this procedure, immediate, late, obstetrical, as I'm sure you can imagine, there can be infection, there can be bleeding, there can be scarring, obviously, um, risks of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, if the instruments that are used are often not clean, this is often done in lay procedures, there can be transmission of infection, HIV, et cetera. Um, and then there are obstetrical complications as well. Um, when, pe when women are infibulated, they may not be able to deliver, they may require a cesarean to deliver, um, the baby may die before it can deliver just because of that closed area. Um, they may have higher risks for hemorrhage, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions that are out there about this procedure. I would say it's not prescribed by any religion in any religious doctrine, and it is practiced by many religions. This is not something that happens only in one religion. In different contexts, it's conducted at different ages, sometimes very young, sometimes coming of age, and in different settings, it's conducted both by health professionals and lay people alike. So if you think that this is something that happens only outside of the healthcare setting, that's 
that's certainly a misconception. Um, there's conflicting evidence as to whether or not there's higher proportions of transmission of HIV related to this procedure. Um, different studies show different uh, outcomes. Some suggest that there's an increased risk contracting HIV related to female genital cutting. Maybe again, as I said, if the instruments are unclean or lots of abrasions that might happen from sexual activity. Other evidence refutes that maybe because of less migration in certain populations, so it's hard to know. There are very many factors. Um, certainly internationally, this is a procedure that's widely condemned. Um, numerous international agencies have come out um, over the past, you know, sort of 25 years condemning this procedure um, and with various global strategies and resolutions. And this is actually now uh, against the law in 26 African and Middle Eastern countries in which it's, per it's known to be performed. Um, but as you well know, law and practice do not always go hand in hand. Um, what is interesting is there are some nice papers in places where it's, for example, used as a coming-of-age activity or a coming-of-age ritual. Um, there are nice papers showing alternatives that can be done, and it's very uh, nicely shown that if you can put in alternative, you know, sort of practices that still recognize the coming-of-age without um, linking it to such a harmful procedure that um, the cutting procedure can quickly be abandoned. Um, the Society of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, who, you know, sort of I tend to look to in terms of guiding our practice in Canada. Um, everybody in the room may already be aware, if you're not, this is a criminal offense in Canada. And there's also, uh, what's interesting is mandatory reporting to child welfare, welfare services is required if you feel that this has happened to somebody who you know. And obviously, you don't have to be a physician to report to, to um, child welfare services. Of course, anybody can make the call. Um, and it's not only if it's happened to somebody, but also if they're at risk. So in a scenario, for example, you know, your neighbor is going home to their native country and they have a young child, you know, if you, I mean, but obviously you need more information than that, but if you think that somebody may literally be traveling to a place where this may be performed while they're there, um, that is legit to be calling health services, uh, child welfare services, sorry, locally. Um, also for my profession, requests for re have to be declined. So if you have a scenario where, for example, a woman's having a baby and she actually wants to, um, the, the cutting procedure to be maintained, if it were to tear during delivery, I mean, not only are we obviously forbidden to perform a cutting procedure, but we are actually forbidden against the criminal code to put anything back together if it's torn apart. We can we can make things stop bleeding, we can make things cosmetic and, and hemostatic, um, but we can't put anything back together. And patients have to be aware of that. If they want to preserve it, then we have to think um, of alternatives to meet their needs. Um, I do perform this procedure. There are a few others who do as well, defibrillation procedures. Um, so there are... I tell patients there are, there are some, there's actually been some recent literature in the, in the New York Times and such about people who are doing experimental procedures to actually try to replace tissue or find the, the nerves um, of the clitoris. I don't do that. Um, and I tell my patients that I can't replace, I, I don't have the skill to replace tissue that is missing. But what we can do in patients who've been infibulated is to open them up and allow for easier menstruation, sexual activity, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I do offer all of my patients counseling around the trauma that that happened to them in the past or that going through a defibrillation procedure may unearth. Um, I have to say, for the most part, as per the previous, uh, you know, sort of presentations, they're often incredibly resilient and just incredibly delighted uh, to proceed forward with this with, without any additional uh, counseling or such. The thing that's happening in my office more recently is um, requests for exam related to refugee claims, so I just thought that I would mention it in this setting. Um, patients, people may be asked for letters to prove that they've had a cutting procedure or maybe part of their refugee claim. Um, you know, with some of the type 1 procedures and things 20, 30 years on, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish the effects um, of a surgical procedure from variations in normal anatomy that people are born with, and there can be a lot of overlap. Um, I, you know, will sort of, I, I, I feel internally conflicted when I get asked to do this. I find on some level it's quite demeaning for somebody to need to be asked for a genital examination as part of their claim, um, but the patients often come to me requesting it and wanting it. Um, I'm very clear with them that I would never deny their history of trauma or their oral history, um, but I am honest with them from my examination in terms of what I can say or the overlap that may be there um, with normal anatomy as well. A lot of times also people feel if they've been cut in the past and they feel that they're walking around looking mutilated and looking different, it actually can be quite affirming to have a physical physician tell you that, again, you know, without any denial of their history and their trauma and their experience, um, that a lay person would never know the difference and they wouldn't have to, they're not sort of walking around bearing that symbol. Um, that can be quite affirming for them. Um, so moving on, I know that's a heavy topic, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
Um, I got a lot of slides to get through, you know that. Uh, but I know that that's a very heavy topic and I just kind of move on and, uh, you know, a lot of people are still, are, st are still deep in it. Um, so Blessing is a 35 year old. She's had three pregnancies and three kids. She's a recently arrived refugee from Nigeria. She's here alone without her husband and children. She has high blood pressure and her medications were stopped and need to be restarted and that's sort of what you spend most of your um, clinical discussion on and she identifies again and again that her husband is back home. So you don't talk about contraception with her. And a few weeks later, she comes in with an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. Women have very complex lives. I learn that every day, and I don't pretend to understand that, you know, yet. Um, so we've got a couple of studies that are in the literature, one from Meb's Clinic in Toronto, um, that, uh, that show that we don't do a great job always of meeting our patients' contraceptive needs. Um, the study from Crossroads showed that, showed that over 30% were using no contraception at the time that the study was done. 23% had an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy in the preceding year, um, and an additional 27% were using no contraception but didn't want to get pregnant. And this is in a, you know, in a setting where we're very attuned to the needs of refugees. Um, so the CMAJ from 2011 recommends screening immigrant women of reproductive age for their unmet contraceptive needs soon after arrival to Canada and providing culturally sensitive patient-centered contraceptive counseling, giving them their method of choice, having contraception on site, and fostering good relationships. And just to review, we have many methods of contraception, um, some that are barrier methods or abstinence and such that have no medical contraindications and no hormones. We have pills, patches, and rings that have a combination of estrogen and progesterone, um, and we have some progesterone only options, um, which offer also injectable and IUD forms, and these are often quite good when women can't take uh, estrogen for a medical reason. Um, emergency contraception is a really important topic. Any contraception talk that I give, I always try to mention this because people forget about it easily and it's so simple. Basically, there are no medical contraindications to this. We use now either ulipristal acetate or progesterone typically. Progesterone doesn't require a prescription. It's at the discretion of the pharmacist over the counter or behind the counter in the pharmacy. Um, and copper IUDs can also be used within seven days of unplanned intercourse. They're actually our most effective uh, emergency contraceptive. Um, I'll mention contraceptive implants. Uh, JDES Implanon or Nexplanon are their names. They aren't currently available in Canada, but we see women arrive uh, with them from elsewhere. They're quite easy to remove, and I'm very happy uh, to teach people to remove them in my setting. I, I do this quite a bit. It's really, really simple, but if you haven't seen it, you don't know it and you don't get it in your training here in Canada. Um, so Faith is 37, four pregnancies and three kids. She had three previous C-sections, one of which was uh, prematurely. She recently arrived from Uganda with her husband and children. She's trying to settle the kids into school and basically she realizes that she's pregnant. Um, so are our refugee patients at higher risk? I know some of my colleagues have addressed this a little bit as well. Um, there are a couple of papers in the literature looking at this, um, and it's hard to know, and with the healthy immigrant effect and things that were mentioned previously as well, but there does seem to be, as we know, higher rates of HIV in some patient populations if they're coming from endemic areas, um, and slightly higher C-section rates and slightly higher preterm birth rates as well. So these patients uh, need appropriate care based on their history and needs. Um, the guidelines from 2011, again, note increased morbidity similar to what I just mentioned. Um, and really, patients have opportunities for care either through family physicians, midwives, or obstetricians, depending on their needs, their location, um, and their desires. I think it's, and you know, that's going to differ a bit by their risk profile. The patient that I described to you who's had three previous C-sections might as well be cared for by an obstetrician because she's going to need a surgical delivery. Other people would be otherwise. I think it's also fair to mention to the patients that um, just sort of the different training that people have. A midwife in Canada is not the same as a midwife in the country that they may be coming from, and so just for them to understand a little bit about the difference in scope of practice and training so that they get the care that they desire and aren't just going with terms that are familiar. Um, Mariam is 46. She's had six pregnancies and two kids. She's recently arrived from Niger, and she has really heavy periods, bleeding between periods, and she's never even heard of a pap smear. Um, so 60 to 90 percent of invasive cervical cancers are in women who've not been screened for cervical cancers for at least five years or ever, um, and immigrants in certain subgroups certainly have much lower screening rates than their Canadian-born counterparts, women from Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. Um, so our guidelines are that sexually active women should be screened um, from the age of 21 uh, or when they become sexually active, uh, if it's later, every three years if their screens are normal, and to screen until the age of 70. Um, and so really important to initiate 
eight of us when women moved to Canada. Um, HPV vaccination is without a shadow of a doubt our biggest tool to prevent cervical cancer in the future. Um, we vaccinate here typically in grade eight, um, but catch-up vaccination should be done where possible and people should be vaccinated when they come here. Anna's 34, she's from Colombia. She's had four pregnancies and no kids. She's a refugee here with her husband. She had two miscarriages in Colombia, two more since arriving in Canada, all very early on. Um, and she's seeking investigations and support to achieve pregnancy. She and her husband have been together for 15 years and they finally feel safe enough to start building their family. Um, I could talk for hours on infertility. I don't have the evidence to support it, but we do see in our in our clinic where we see um, refugee patients in particular, I would say regardless of what it says on the referral, regardless of the reason that I'm being asked to see the patient, if they're 45 or under, they all want to talk about their fertility um, and their challenges with fertility regardless of what they're there for. Um, fertility is important to all. There are tons of different themes. and Some of the themes that we see in refugee populations can include the value of the childbearing to the value of women in the culture that they're coming from, the lack of family that they have in their new country and their ability to create a family by having kids, solidifying relationships. Some of them don't need ongoing relationships and just want the baby. As I said, we see a lot of very complex uh, lives in women. Um, fertility treatments, I work in Ontario, obviously. Fertility treatments are now covered by our provincial health insurance plan as they are in a number of provinces, but they are not covered by the interim federal health plan for our refugee patients. Um, so you can do some workup and things, you know, sort of general gynecology testing under interim federal health, but you can't offer any extensive treatments. Um, I provide you with some resources here, and thank you very much.